Started? Okay. All right. So welcome to the Guam Women's Chamber of Commerce 2022 Legislative Forum for our Democratic Party candidates. My name is Dana Williams. I'm the news editor for Pacific Daily News, and I will be your moderator for the evening. All Democratic Party candidates for the 37th Guam Legislature were invited to participate in the forum. Uh, due to time constraints, the Chamber decided to limit participation to the first 10 candidates to respond to the invitation. Tonight's event is free and open to the public, and media have been invited to attend. In fairness to all candidates and the audience, time limits will be strictly enforced. Each candidate will have one minute for an opening statement. I will then call upon two candidates at a time to ask a series of questions prepared by the Guam Women's Chamber of Commerce membership. <laughs> Each candidate will have two minutes to answer each question. After the question and answer portion, we'll have a lightning round where all candidates must answer yes or no to each question's asked. Um, they have paddles there to answer the questions with. The audience will have the opportunity to submit questions during the forum, which will be screened and presented to the candidates during the lightning round. If time permits, candidates will have one minute for a closing statement. A timekeeper will hold up signs to indicate when you have one minute, 30 seconds, and 15 seconds remaining. When your time is up, you will hear the bell ring. Can we hear the bell? Thank you. <laughs> all, all candidates will rotate the order in which they respond to questions. For audience members wishing to submit a question to the lightning round, please DM your questions to Guam Women's Chamber on Instagram, where our team will be monitoring in real time. Make sure that your question can be answered in a yes-no format. Questions will be screened to ensure that they are applicable to all candidates and are not personal in nature and are addressed to subjects relevant to this forum. So we will now begin with opening statements. For incumbents, please share what accomplishments this past legislative term you are most proud of. And for new candidates, what is your top priority to accomplish if you are elected? And we'll start right here with Ms. Negan Bell. Services. I have spent the bulk of my life, my career, uh, spanning four decades in the field of social services. I have worked with um, troubled youth, with the elderly, with veterans, and with persons who are homeless. And I'm excited to take my next step into the policy forum and uh, be your senator in the 37th Guam Legislature. Buenos Aires and Havadé. My name is Fred Berdalli, Jr. I'm the former Chief of Police with the Guam Police Department, former Director of Veterans Affairs uh, during uh, the uh, um, Leon Guerrero and Tenorio administration. Uh, this is the third time I've tried to run for uh, the legislature, so I'll be new if I'm elected. Uh, my priority is law enforcement uh, to keep our community safe. Securing the future for our families uh, means that our community is safe, our businesses are safe, our neighborhoods are safe. Uh, what I want to do, of course, I'm from Santa, the village of Santa Rita. Uh, my wife is Dr. Dolores Berdalio Lilly. She teaches at Tijan High School for the Guam Community College and Technology. These are some of the things I think we can leverage besides just keeping our community safe. And I also want to help the veterans. The veterans deserve a job deserve the work, deserve opportunities to succeed. Uh, thank you, and I uh, look forward to the questions from the Guam Women's uh, Chambers of Commerce. 
Uh, today, my name is Jonathan Savares. First and foremost, I want to thank the Longman's Chamber of Commerce for putting on such a wonderful, uh, giving us such a wonderful, a wonderful opportunity. I'm from the village of Derido. I was medically retired from the United States Army. Over the last 10 years, I've actually had to relearn how to walk. I've had to relearn how to walk and come off a bunch of narcotics and medication. I want to stand with our veterans because I know that we can help do better for them. I want to stand going back to the community. My mom is Mayor Savars. I grew up in, in the background of public service for the last 22 years. I want to ensure that I work with the mayors and the municipalities to create our to grow our communities to, together. When I say this, I talk about re, re going back and revisiting the idea of it takes a, ch a village to raise a child. We see our villages not have, not even knowing our neighbors. I want to strengthen our community from the from the ground from the ground level, starting with the municipalities working with GPD to strengthen our island as a whole. Thank you. Hi everybody, my name is Dwayne St. Nicholas. I uh, first, first initially wanted to propose a legislation to legalize consumer grade fireworks. I'm, as you know, I'm a, I'm a happy guy, fun guy. I'm a former law enforcement officer, I'm a former school counselor, I'm a veteran, a combat veteran. Uh, I'm Santa Claus <laughs> and uh, I'm also a wedding officiant. I marry gay and uh, straight people. I love, every, everywhere I go, I've always brought hope, uh, love, family, and uh, I can bring that to the legislature. You elect me, you'll never want to let me go. Thank you. Go ahead, shoot it, all right. Okay. Hi, and how are you? Good evening. My name is Joe Santa Augustine. Uh, I'm from the village of Chigu. I'm happily married to Joanne about the charter from Santa Rita. We have three children, 11 grand grandchildren, and one great-grandchild. I've been in public service my entire career. I was in the, I was in the Army, for, I retired after 26 years. I was a former police officer, a former tax investigator, and a compliance officer with the Department of Revenue and Taxation. For the past six years, I've strived to help our people as individuals, families, and locally owned businesses. There's more work to do, and I would like the opportunity to continue working for you, the people of Guam. So uh, as we move along, uh, I'm number 13 on the Democratic side. Thank you very much. And thank you to the Chamber, the Women's Chamber of Commerce for inviting us. Good evening. Good evening, many of God's blessings to each and every one of you. I'm Senator Tina Munya Barnes, and it is my honor to serve as the people of Guam as your Vice Speaker for the 36th Guam Legislature. As a veteran lawmaker, I know that we can agree that our island has been through a lot, but we have more work to do. I believe in my heart that small businesses can lead the way, but we, but they need our help. And I want to say that while government cannot guarantee success, we can knock down bar barriers to success. And I just want to share, uh, based on the moderator, she said, what were our, my greatest accomplishments? I want to say closing the chapter on war claims, working with my colleagues and WICHI, which is the Western Interstate Commission for Higher Education, to lower the cost of college for kids uh, on Guam and throughout the Blue Continent, the Micronesia. And I had uh, the opportunity to get over $250,000 here to work with trash shipment so that we can create new jobs for our people. Thank you. Half a day. My name is Kelly Marsh Titano. I am number 10 on the Democratic side of the ballot. I am a daughter of Guam, having grown up here. I have a master's degree in Micronesian Studies, a PhD in Cultural Heritage Studies, and I've taught at the University of Guam and GCC. I am a hard worker and a proven leader. As a first-time senator and through COVID, in the beginning stages, believe it or not, I was able to get 12 bills made into laws. Those laws diversified and strengthened our economy, they kept our community safe, and they improved our quality of life. I want to get back into the legislature to fight for a better future for all of us. There are three S's to this. Sustainable solutions, improving our safety, and speaking truth to power. And that means keeping our government accountable, both local and federal, so that it is truly serving you, the people of Guam. Sijuasana. Hafri, good evening. Thank you to the Guam Women Chambers. I really appreciate the opportunity you've given each and every one of us. Um, 
Running for public office is not the most popular decision, obviously. Oh, there we are. I just came back, I guess, from Jupiter. So, yeah. So, again, I want to thank each and every one of you for coming out this evening. Um, those attending virtually, we really appreciate your time and uh, being with us. So, my name is Roy Kanata. I am the youngest candidate running for office. The reason why I stepped up to run for office is because it's time to pass the torch to the next generation. And I want to inspire the next generation to, vo to volunteer, vote, and be a part of our community. We need our voices to be heard, and that's why I stepped up to run for office. Because the late Angel Sanchez said that generations will come, generations will go, but if the generation today is not willing to face the challenges head on today, then the next generation will face the same challenges. So please, so please. register, vote, participate, stop hating, participate. I'm Burger Boy, so please vote for the burger. I'm number four. I didn't want to have a four for four me. Try it out. <laughs> Hoppa day, I'm William Parkinson. My father is former Speaker Don Parkinson. I'm running for Senator. I'm number two on the ballot and I'm humbly asking for your vote. I was raised on Guam and I grew up to be a federal firefighter for nine years. I was out there living my best life until I came home to take care of my 100% uh, disabled veteran father. Seeing the struggles of the community and the vets called me to action. I have a unique portfolio of things I've done in my life. I think my experience as a student, a firefighter, a small business manager, an activist, and as a policy writer give me a unique perspective that will be helpful to the legislature. I'm a very positive person. I think that um, if we all work together, we can be part of the solution together. And uh, I think we could all do it because we are all in this together. So please consider me for one of your votes. I'm number two on the ballot, William Parkinson. Hoppa day, my name is Sabina Paris. I was born and raised here in Guam. I'm an incumbent senator. I've served in the 35th and 36th Guam legislatures. Prior to becoming a senator, I was a medical technologist, diabetes researcher, and Simon Sanchez high school teacher. I'm running for your election because I want to continue to serve you and to build upon the platform of sustainability, which I worked hard to deliver these past two terms. Some of my accomplishments are ensuring clean drinking water through overhauling the Safe Drinking Water Act, addressing illegal dumping by increasing enforcement capacity and resources, um, modernizing the animal welfare law through the PAWS Act, um, addressing uh, how government spends taxpayers' dollars by meaningful procurement reform, um, addressing the high cost of living and climate change simultaneously, simultaneously through the Guam Tropical Energy Code. So there's many more that I've done, over 20 bills. Um, and I humbly ask for your support to continue this, this work of sustainability. I'm number 15, last but not least, I'm number 15 on the Democratic side. Thank you. And um, if anybody <laughs> wants to applaud, you know, uh, that is cool. All right, we're going to start with the open-ended questions. My assistant will draw a question. These um, are secret questions. A, a very small team of people prepared them, and the candidates do not know them in advance. Um, so I will read the question, and then each can um, we'll have two two candidates. We'll have two minutes each to answer the question. The first two candidates up, uh, first will be Fred Berdaio and then Kelly Marsh Titano. So you guys will answer this question and then we will move to the next question, which will involve two other candidates. What would you do to diversify Guam's economy to generate more revenue and opportunities? So again, we start with Fred Berdaio Jr. Okay, thank you for that question. One of the ideas I had, and this comes because I come from a music background, and um, I've been talking to some constituents about the expanding, you know, music education. Uh, one great model is Mount Carmel School, where my son Fred Berdali went to. He's part of Four Piece Band, and he's playing in Jacksonville. And I want to showcase the talent of our of our artists, people in music, people in 
and the film industry that we can do. And we're right here as, as, as a place where uh, that can take place because the Guam Community College, I'm an alumni of Guam Community College. I graduated with a criminal justice degree here and I also from the police academy. But Guam Community College, together with the University of Guam, I, I think uh, University of Guam is where my son went and he went to uh, some music lessons there and he's played in bands. I played in bands. And I think we can tap that resource as an extra industry, you know, as an additional industry to, that diverse, uh, to have a diverse economy. Because our bread and butter has always been in, in tourism. But one key thing I want to add, you can have an industry of uh, entertainment, film, music, tourism, and every other. But if you don't have a, a community that's safe that improves in their safety, that's why I want to really stress and amplify that. That my priority is to make sure the businesses are safe, our artists, our entertainment uh, uh, industry and uh, film industry, everything is protected because there are individuals out there that will exploit the gaps uh, uh, that exist with a shortage of manpower among our law enforcement. So I want to just link that to ensuring a safer community and our artists and support them and uh, support that as a, a, an additional third leg when it comes down to uh, strengthening the diversity of our economy. And then we have, of course, there are other ideas, of course, and that brings in veterans who some have that skill set and, and identifying the veterans to come in and participate then, and of course, our military. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Kelly Marsh Titano, what would you do to diversify Guam's economy to generate more revenue and opportunities? One of the laws that I put into place is to create an intra regional commerce commission. Now, because of COVID and travel restrictions and things like this, it hasn't gotten fully up and running yet. So I want to get back into the legislature, continue working with the administration to make sure that this gets impaneled and it gets to work. We have a lengthy history between all of us in Micronesia and the Indo-Pacific region. And so what it does is it takes our historic ties, our historic networks, it looks for economic and other opportunities and it builds on it. For example, right now we're receiving quite a bit of produce from Luta. It's really helping build up their economy. It's taking care of the need for us. And it may surprise you to know that we actually have quite a bit of produce coming from Guam to places like the Marshall Islands. And it is so highly sought after, they like it much better than U.S. produce. It's healthier, it's tastier, it looks better, and it lasts longer. So there are many opportunities like this, uh, such as in Saipan, they're growing mafala breadfruit. And now they're growing it to export as breadfruit flour, which is a growing trend. So they're to look for um, opportunities like this and then smooth the pathway. And within our larger region, we have areas like Taiwan. Taiwan is the leading manufacturer of microchips, which are incredibly important. They're in almost everything that we have with technology nowadays. The U.S. has fallen desperately behind to the point that we are vulnerable to the rest of the world. Just like we're vulnerable with gas right now, we will become vulnerable to all of these Asian countries who are the microchip manufacturers. The U.S. is now in uh, providing incentives for, uh, for uh, developing this kind of industry. So those are the type of regional Thank you. Um, industries to build on. Okay, let's go to question two. This is for Tina Munya Barnes and Sarah Nididal. Access to affordable health insurance is a huge challenge for a large cross-section of our population, from small business owners to nonprofits and all of their employees. What can you do as a, legislature, as a legislator to improve access to affordable health care for those who don't qualify for Medicaid or employer-subsidized health plans? Thank you so very much for that question. I want to say that when I started in the 27th Guam legislature, I looked at universal health care and literally was crucified by the private community for even thinking about it. But times have changed. And looking at revisiting universal health care, um, we can do this by increasing the pool and even asking small businesses like those here uh, to join. So more of the people in, 
better possibilities of having uh, prices uh, reduced and making sure that everybody on Guam is insured. Also, tapping into federal grants that are out there. Uh, just recently, we've received millions and millions of dollars, but resources don't come here if we don't do our job to facilitate. So we need to look at, at federal resources also that can help us, but more importantly, universal health care, I think, is very vital and important. Thank you. Thank you. I will, I'll repeat the question uh, for Sarah and Edmund. Access to affordable health insurance is a huge challenge for a large cross-section of our population, from small business owners to nonprofits and all of their employees. What can you do as a legislator to improve access to affordable health care for those who don't qualify for Medicaid or employer-subsidized health plans? I agree with, uh, I agree with uh, Senator Tina Mooney Barnes on universal health care. I think the time has come for us, and maybe it wasn't a popular topic um, a couple of years ago, but certainly now the world's a different place and we need to look at you know different ways in which to do the work that we've done in the past. And I think universal health care is certainly a, um, some, an issue to be revisited. Now, that would provide for health care for all people. But I also think one of the, one of the areas that need to be um, also addressed is providing initiatives for people to get into uh, the health field. Uh, I think that we need to create uh, scholarships and other programs. I know we have some now, but I would like to expand that because I really believe that that's the way forward is to have more and more folks involved in the field of health care, both as uh, nursing assistants to doctors to, to nurses and those in allied health. I'd also like to see public health in the villages. So not just, you know, going to the doctor at the, you know, the clinics, but actually extending health care to people um, in the villages. So I'd like to work closely with the mayors to make sure that happens. Thank you. Thank you. Question three. This is for William Parkinson and Sabina Ferris. Which government functions, if any, do you feel would be a good candidate for privatization or a public-private partnership? What specific benefits could be realized by making such a change? And first up, William Parkinson. Um, one of the areas that I think is right for uh, public-private partnerships is in uh, tax collection of delinquent taxes. We have a lot, there's a lot of money out there that just needs to be collected, that enforcement needs to happen. We have laws on the books that generate funds, but it's just not being collected. And I think with uh, public-private partnerships of tax collection, we can see, um, you know, that the incentive is there for the, the private entities they collect the taxes or they don't get paid. And I think it would be a very effective way of getting uh, uh, delinquent taxes collected, especially like air and cigarette taxes, which are notorious for being uh, unpaid to be collected. So that's one area. Um, another area for public-private partnerships, um, maybe for helping screening at the port having a private contractor there, because I believe we only screen less than 10% of the cargo that comes into the port, and I think if we were able to screen more at the port, we'd be able to really put a dent into the uh, drug trade, the meth, and all the things that are just really poisonous to the community. Thank you. Thank you. Now I'll read it for um, Sabina Ferris. Which government functions, if any, do you feel would be a good candidate for privatization or a public-private partnership? What specific benefits could be realized by making such a change? So my view is that um, automation, so there's a lot of things that government doesn't do well, and uh, one of them is automation. And I think that you know hiring the, the consultants, um, the experts to do that. So uh, I believe that's where uh, the, the areas of uh, privatization can occur. I generally believe that you know government can reform. Um, they can they can do the job 
cheaper. So that's that's the, the, the operative word is if they can reform their, their operations, they can do the job cheaper because you know the the cost to the uh, the, the taxpayers is less. Um, but yeah, I'm open to privatization in more of the technological fields um, that government lacks. Thank you. This question is for Roy Anthony Kanata and Joe S. St. Augustine. The 2017 Guam Economic Census reported that the percentage of women-owned businesses on the island ranges between 9% to 22%, depending on the industry. Recent national data shows that women-owned businesses are growing at double the rate of businesses overall. However, women-owned businesses still earn only 30 cents on the dollar and are far less likely to apply for and receive loans or equity investments. What are some ideas you have to improve access to resources and capital for women in business? Who starts me? Oh, yes, yeah, sorry. Um, um, you, you start. Okay. Um, I work for Senator Shelton. I believe my boss has worked really tirelessly with the Guam Women Chambers to establish the women's um, business tax um, incentives. So I think we need to work hard with you guys, work collaboratively to find more solutions for you guys and invest in more um, women-friendly business. I think in anything, we just need to work with the community to find solutions. And that's all it is, is working together to find solutions and how we can better improve the, the government service and customer service. Thank you for that question. Thank you. I'll read it again. The, the 2017 Guam Economic Census reported that the percentage of women-owned businesses on the island ranges between 9% to 22%, depending on the industry. Recent national data shows that women-owned businesses are growing at double the rate of businesses overall. However, women-owned businesses still earn only 30 cents on the dollar and are far less likely to apply for and receive loans or equity investments. What are some ideas you have to improve access to resources and capital for women in business? Well, for, you know, for women in business, being a former tax investigator, number one, we need to play, figure out a way how to get the tax breaks to the women. You know, it, it's like the military. If you're, if you're a woman and you're a veteran, you get first priority. Maybe we, we need to turn that, that tide that way. We're, we're just not giving people breaks, but we make sure the women get a shot at, at the market. They, they, they'll get the priority on contract for government, and, and other areas of, of concern. And um, we can move from there. That'll be a start. Thank you. Our next question is for Dwayne St. Nicholas and Jonathan Savars. Um, Mr. St. Nicholas, you, you will answer first. Law requires Guam Power Authority to transition to 100% renewable energy by 2045. GPA is on track to achieve 25% of energy from renewables, renewables by 2022 and hopes to achieve 50% of energy from renewables by 2030 with the completion of the Ukuru power plant. Do you think the goal is realistic? How should our island approach it so that it is viable economically as well as environmentally? Thank you for that. Um, as you know, I'm the owner of Jay Goodman. I was one of the first company is probably the only company here to bring in solar air conditioners. I, I have one down in my shop in Agate. Um, if you want to go 100% renewable, you come and visit me. The, when the sun comes up, my air conditioner turns on. When the sun goes down, it turns off. I'm about ready to, to put on a battery to this, to this device so that it can run strictly on solar. Solar batteries, that's 100%. You don't have to we even took out GPA from the mix. We brought, we went, we went to a to to a, a, a forum. Uh, we, we rolled in the the AC, and GPA kind of like frowned at us. Could you imagine if everybody had this in their island, in, in, on the island, and it would put GPA out of business? It's not that I want to do that. It's what I, what I do is I want to bring I want to bring uh, great items, uh, great great uh, products to the island at, at low cost that you can live very comfortably. Air conditioning, what a wonderful way to live. It's comfortable, it's, 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 and with the sun, it's free. 
So um, with with uh, with uh, GPA achieving fifty percent, hundred percent, I think it's very viable with the help of us business people dealing with solar. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Mr. Samaras, I'll read the question for you. Law requires Guam Power Authority to transition to 100% renewable energy by 2045. GPA is on track to achieve 25% of energy from renewables by 2022 and hopes to achieve 50% of energy from renewables by 2030 with the completion of the Ukudu Power Plant. Do you think the goal is realistic? How should our island approach it so that it is viable economically as well as environmentally? Thank you for that question. I absolutely agree that we can get that, that goal is attainable. The reason why I say this is we, as we build more, more homes, we need to start creating programs like they have in California and Hawaii that mandate the, the, the use of solar, putting solar systems on these homes. These new, when, because it's additional, it's an additional, uh, it's an additional strain on our grid. So we have to, one, protect the infrastructure we have, right? Because we can't put more infrastructure, we can't put more things on top if we're not protecting what's already existing. Because the, the new existing stuff, the new stuff that we're going to put on, as we stand up all these solar farms that we're seeing, we're seeing Marble Cave getting ready to stand up. Uh, and we have, I know that they have the big solar farm, but we need to make sure that, um, Dwayne is absolutely right, we have to get into battery storage here. We don't have a battery storage facility, and I, in the legislature and working with GPA, I believe this is one of the major priorities we need to look for to ensure that we hit that we hit that goal, because we can harness as much energy as possible from the sun throughout the year, and you actually really need at least I believe it's fifty to seventy percent clear clarity on the day, and then we can actually harness at full full capacity. If this is harnessed at full capacity, we fill the batteries, and this means that he doesn't have to lose his power. And overnight, creating battery, batteries, creating a building a battery storage facility will get us to, to that to the goal and hold us for longer periods of time. Also, working with the hotel industry, right? This is a, a huge consumer. The hotel industry, the, 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 the hotel industry, as well as the military buildup, we have to take the impacts and look at ensure that those facilities are moving towards renewable energy to ensure that we hit the target goals that we that we have set. Thank you. Thank you. All right, now we're going to do the second round of questions. And uh, this time, the order that people answer them in is going to be reversed. So we'll start again um, with uh, Kelly Marsh Titano and Fred Cordalio. And this time, <coughs> Kelly Marsh Titano will go first. A new public law enables businesses with gross annual revenues of $500,000 or less to pay 3% business privilege tax. For the remaining businesses, do you advocate for a permanent rollback in BPTs from 5% to 4%? And if so, what is the best strategy to fill this 1% gap? You know, this is something that comes up in conversation quite a bit. It's a very common question. Uh, we've all probably answered it uh, several, several times. And um, it's something that we do need to consider uh, going forward. Right? We have to always, as leaders, be looking at our economy, be looking at our situation, and creating that balance. What is it that our community needs? And right now, we have high levels of need. And what is it that we can all be contributing, in, and what is that balance? One of the things that we need to consider when we're thinking about this possible rollback is the military, for the next five years at least, is going to be investing through their contracts and contractors over uh, somewhere around $1.2 billion a year. So if we do a rollback, what we will have to weigh out is the potentially, I think it's around $50 million that our government is going to be rolling back as well. We're coming out of a really difficult time. For the last 10 years or so, we have had to tighten our belts. We've had to ask every agency to get down to the bare minimum, to put off capital improvements, to put off so many things. And we are just getting to a point where we're able to relieve some of that, get to some of those capital improvements, get some of the staff members back in so that they can address our high level of need. So, um, I don't think that there's a simple solution. I think it is going to take some discussion, 
We are getting some relief, but we're seeing some things like the Medicaid uh, cap being <laughs> potentially put back on and us having to take that burden back on and shoulder some other uh, unfunded mandates or responsibilities. So I think we're going to have to think very carefully of whether we can do without that $50 million from this very limited time of build-up. Thank you. And now for Fred Verdelio Jr. A new public law enables businesses with gross annual revenue of $500,000 or less to pay 3% EPTs. For the remaining businesses, do you advocate for a permanent rollback in EPTs from 5% to 4%? And if so, what is the best strategy to fill this 1% gap? Okay, um, you know, the most important law that the Guam legislature, all the senators, their, their most important responsibility in the law is the budget. Uh, whenever the budget comes around, the allocation of the resources, the financial resources, they're going to go to all the government of Guam agencies. And they're supposed to be an expenditure revenue report to see what happens. And it's very tempting sometimes to reduce uh, taxes. And I'm sort of like, you know, I have family members who are in small businesses, and I have family members who are connected to businesses as much as we want to sometimes soften some of the costs uh, that the businesses have. We also have to look at what's going to happen with the government. Are they cost efficient? As a senator in the Guam legislature, one of the things I'm going to look at, uh, especially when it comes down to the revenue and expenditure report, is how the government is spending their monies. You know, are, are, they, are the police spending on pickup trucks when it should be really a patrol vehicle? You know, because what do you do with pickup trucks? How that can sometimes be used for other purposes the dilapidation of some buildings that are not being in use, our current public schools and the situation that's happening there. And that's why it's very important, especially when we're talking about the economic situation, about businesses coming, especially with this pandemic, looking for relief from their lawmakers. Careful deliberation must be made, cost-benefit analysis of that. Would it hurt the government to the point where the government can't operate and give the essential services of health public safety and education? Will it hurt our generation of college students right now here that of tuition having to be raised because we gave a little bit of too much of a break on the business side? So there has to be a balance and you can, assure, you can be rest assured that I'll be very deliberative when it comes down to the budget law that's going to happen where we're going to look at some of those proposals. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question is for Sarah Nedadog and Tina Munya Barnes. Uh, we'll start with uh, Sarah Nedadog. You go first. How will you address the lack of affordable housing for low to moderate income families? That's a really. <laughs> um, I've been dealing with the homeless situation for the last, excuse me, for the last couple of years. And I have seen uh, the mass exodus of uh, our people from their homes. One, do you think the government should take away the ability for a woman to choose her reproductive pathway? Two, do you support the permanent rollback of BPT from 5% to 4%? of a new hospital in Manila. Next. Do you support implementation of a territorial sales tax? Do you support implementation of an internet sales tax? Do you 
support the Chamorros of Guam to be able to decide on their own political status? Do you support universal health care? Bill 71, Support for Women-Owned Businesses Act, which gives a 5% procurement advantage to women-owned small businesses that are SBA certified. And if you are not an incumbent, how would you have voted for it? And we have more. Would you support policies to prevent gender discrimination in the workplace? It's a federal mandate. Okay, we have something new and different. This is a question for all candidates. Everybody has one minute to respond. We, <laughs> we must, we will, no, no more battles. Battles down. Lower your battles, please. That way for the battle. We'll start right here. And the question is, do you plan on making education one of your top priorities? What plans do you have exactly one minute or less? Yes, definitely. I think that's, uh, that's the way forward for us. So we really need to identify those, um, especially our young people, who are struggling in school. We've got to do early identification with them. And we've got to, you know, the whole thing about, uh, you know, um, uh, staying in school, mandatory school. I think the, the, the approach has to be working very closely with children, especially those who come, uh, who are already indicating that they're experiencing some problems, and identify their individual path so that they can move forward. Some of it's going to be vocational, some of it's going to be academic, but everyone, everyone must have something by the time they turn 18. They have to have some kind of certification and educational attainment. Thank you. Yes, I will support education. It will be a priority. I come from a family that really supports education. My grandmother, Tadester Underwood, was a lifelong educator. My uncle Robert Underwood, the former congressman, also uh, influenced me. And um, many of my siblings are teachers, including my wife, who's watching right now. Um, one of the things that is very important is to make sure each and every one of you here who attend the Guam Community College and the University of Guam, those out there watching this, continue to learn each and every single day. Uh, a lot of times, even in the police department, they called me uh, the chief who's book smart because I had a lot of books, but you know what? It's a passport, and what education does, it opens the doors for opportunity. It's the key that opens the door to opportunities. Thank you, Mr. Judge Moss. Uh, Absolutely, I'll support ed education. Um, one of the biggest things I have concerning me right now that's in front of me is my alma mater, Simon Sanchez High School, has been on the chopping block. Now, right next door, F.B. Leon Girls fall is falling apart. Also, when I, my mom, uh, just like my family, my, my mom just recently won the, uh, a national award for the, uh, for the Fellow of our, uh, Friendship of Education Friendship Award. National award, 56 people that she competed against and she was she, out of, uh, from, from Guam that award was won. Uh, things that I want to ensure, looking at what she has done to create that is, she's actually worked with Department of Education uh, to draft federal grants to create more, using the municipal infrastructure, just as we did to build a, a Stillwell Elementary School or Middle School, using the gym, the gym facility to build another high school, uh, middle school. These are projects, and looking at municipal infrastructure would also give us the ability to look at where else we can put schools. 
using the, the to basically piggyback. And this is how we accomplish accomplish more for our education. Mike's life. Oh, good. Mike's life. Num number one, um, you know, I was on the Board of Education for six years. I was the chairman. I support education totally. We need to hold the Department of Education and all the education institutions accountable. We've got to make sure that, number one, for the Department of Education, I actually promoted with them that we need to start testing our, our students so they make sure that when they go up the grade, they actually earn the grade, not have social promotion. And, and that's one of the, the, the things that we're, we're finding out now. It's no different what we're finding out at GCC and UG. It's when they te when they, they want to go to the University of Walmart GC and they try to take the placement test, they find out they don't even meet the, the education requirements. We need to change that. But at the same time, we need to do what the private schools are doing. Parents, you need to be part of the schools. You send your kids to schools. When they have parents just come, you need to be, you need, uh, take part in that. And then when we turn around the government of Guam, we need the government to come up and find and force the Department of Education. They received two hundred eighty-seven million dollars to fix the schools. Get it fixed. Don't make excuses for not using the funds for what it was intended for. Thank you. See, Joe Smalsey, as I share the same sentiments of all the previous speakers, I want to say that education is very important, and of course we support that. But for the for the first time in a very long time, Guam does have the resources to fix our schools. But the legal mechanism is not there. I will personally continue to work with the private sector, the Guam DOE leadership, and the governor to responsibly remove any procurement barriers to ensuring our children have safe schools. Very, very important, ladies and gentlemen. And we also need to preserve who we are as other people. And, that, and something that's been in the books is tomorrow immersion and teaching our kids to protect our language and who we are as children. So that's what I want to do, and that is education is key to full success. I am at least the fourth generation of educators in my family. And so education, that's something I grew up with, and it's something that I have definitely spent a lot of time thinking about. So there are four main ideas that I have right now. One is to get our uh, curriculum infused with sustainable concepts. We need to have on our island, and the way that I look at sustainability is, we meet our needs today, but we do not compromise the needs of our children or our grandchildren and their ability to meet them. And so they need to be growing up thinking sustainably on our island from the beginning. Another is, it surprises me that our education board has no teacher voice. I'm looking at the board composition, and to me it makes a lot of sense and the people that I've talked to to give them a voice. Capital improvement, we have to figure out a way that it is ongoing. It is not a one-time fix, it is not a happenstance, it is not a one-time federal grant, and recruitment, uh, we need to improve that. Education is a priority of mine. My mother's a teacher. I think everyone in their family has some kind of educational uh, family member. Um, you know, we, we all want nice things. We can have beautiful JFK High School. We can have a beautiful Astumbo um, gym. We can have a beautiful book. But all of these things, it, it comes down to the community. I was the class of 2014. My school year, we shut down the school. We walked out and went against the board. We scared the governor. We scared the superintendent. We scared the senators. As a matter of fact, Senator Munia Barnes, I think, was a senator. And she did the walk with the sharks. So that was a true statement to the, to the leadership that we really have some concerning health, cons health issues in our school. And it's not just the facility. Um, we really need to look at just the outside. It looks like a prison. And that's why I'm a proud public school product. But I think we need to really invest in our education, but also the, minds of, the mindset of our generation. 
It's really sad. We just saw a TikTok go viral about a kid vandalizing the school property. We have restrooms out there, not just only in the parks, but even in the schools. There's no locks on the doors. Thank you for that question. So, uh, as far as what I'd like to do with education, because, yeah, I, I'm, I'm a big believer in education. I was uh, educated public school system here on Guam. I raised, uh, graduated from GW class in 2004. I'd love to rebuild that school. I think all these schools need to rebuild. I think they need to be rebuilt in sustainable ways, put solar panels on them so that the power bills aren't so expensive on them. Um, but even looking beyond just the primary schools, I think we need to take a good hard look at secondary education. I'm a big proponent in um, free college and trade schools, especially for positions that we need here on Guam. We have a nursing shortage, let's offer some free schooling for nurses. We have a teacher shortage, same with teachers, because then we could use that as a mechanism to retain people here on Guam. You, we teach you how to be a nurse, come live here and be a nurse for 10 years. But we need to train people here on Guam for the jobs we need here on Guam. Thank you. So I've been a teacher in the public school system for nine years, and so I know firsthand the challenges uh, in our school system. Uh, one of the projects that I've, I've been working on as a senator was to expand the GCC model. So right now there are satellite programs within the high schools, and I, I can totally see that we can expand the, the, the offerings uh, because as oversight chair for, for labor, I see that there's many jobs that are not being filled because there's not qualified pool of people. So what if we can expand the offering so that it can lead directly into, a, it creates pipelines into these positions um, that we need. Um, so as a teacher, this is called vertical alignment. So you work backwards from where you want to end up and what kind of curriculum that's going to be, all the way even down to elementary school. The other thing I want to point out is we need to focus on early education because there's a 30 million word gap for literate poor households. And we need to start um, investing in uh, our youth prior to them becoming into the school system. Thank you. Now we're going to allow candidates to have one minute each for a closing statement. We'll start, um, we're going to go in alphabetical order. We'll start with Fred Berdaio, Jr. Okay, first, uh, I'd like to thank the Guam Women's Chamber of Commerce for inviting us here today. Again, I'm number eight on the Democratic Party ballot. Um, I want to secure the future for our families. What that translates to is keeping Guam safe and strengthening our law enforcement, strengthening the presence of them to keep our neighborhoods safe, keep our schools safe. Well, we talked about education. I want to invest in also in taking a look at the veterans that we have, making sure that when they come back from deployment, they have an opportunity for success. I want to also make sure that we take care of the drug situation that we have, substance abuse, you know, treatment for them, addiction and education, and then also the last thing I want to do is look at businesses and how we can invest and support them too. A private-public partnership, cost efficiency for government. And uh, these are the things I'm going to do as, as um, your uh, senator. I come from a background with uh, education at the University of Guam, University of Oklahoma, Naval Postgraduate School, and I know I can reach some solutions and, and, and press up that legislation. Thank you. Next, we'll go to Kelly Marsh Titanum. So the first thing I want to do is encourage you to find me on my website, on Facebook, on Instagram, and TikTok is my latest favorite. <laughs> my name is Kelly Marsh Titano. I am number 10 on the Democratic side of the ballot. And as I mentioned before, I am a hard worker and a proven leader. Right now, I have laws that are working to lower the cost of living, diversify and build our economy, improve our quality of life. I want to continue to do this to fight for a better future for all of us. So if we go through those three S's, I want to do that through sustainable solutions towards making our community safer and speaking truth to power. That's not always easy to do, but we have to hold our government accountable. So I humbly ask for your vote and to consider me this upcoming election. So do us maasi and uh, again, try to find me on TikTok. <laughs> 
Melbourne go to Tina Munia Barnes. Cecil Sponsi, as a mother, a grandmother, a great grandmother, your public servant for over 42 years, I want to share with you. I'm a great facilitator. I want to continue to be your public servant. My goals create better and higher paying jobs, make health insurance more affordable, lower the cost of housing. I am a good facilitator. I want to continue to be your servant. I humbly ask you to give me one of your powerful gifts of vote. And I want to say thank you. And thank you to the Lord of 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 the Lord I am number one on the Democrat side. But you can vote for everybody here. Sign up for the Lord Now we'll go to Sarah Nedito. Thank you everyone for being here. I get excited when I see a group of young people uh, coming out and wanting to know and be educated on uh, who's on the ballot. I think that's really important. And in many of uh, my years in uh, social work and human services, I've promoted civic engagement. So I want to thank all of you for coming. And I want to encourage you to get your, um, your friends, your relatives, uh, your, your, you know, just people around you to, to register and vote. Because we, we want to have a really good turnout. I think that's most important. Um, I am number five on the Democratic side. I'm a social worker. I'm a person who's been involved in policy. I've taught here at Guam Community College, at the Police Academy, and at the University of Guam in social policy and community services. And I'm really committed to seeing us move to the next level. And I ask all of you to also... You thank know, you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, William Parkinson. Hey, everyone. If, uh, if you take nothing from this forum, I need you to remember this. You need to vote for number two, William Parkinson. Because I want to be your senator. I will stand outside in the rain in the bush to be your senator. That's how bad I want it. And yeah, let me tell you what, who is your senator matters. This election matters. The people that are going to go in, they are going to speak for you on things like reproductive health, on gay rights, on contraceptive rights, on how we reopen the island into this future. So please. If nothing else, please vote for number two, William Parkinson, because I will stand in the bush, in the rain, fighting for you. Thank you. Thank you. So, Sabina Perez. I just want to thank the Guam Women's Chamber for this opportunity, and I want to thank all of you for becoming more informed about the candidates. And I just humbly ask for your support and continued trust uh, to continue to build upon um, this platform of sustainability, which I've worked so hard for. And as you know, sustainability is not, we haven't accomplished that. And I'm willing to put in the hard work to craft the long-term solutions to the issues that are facing our community today. Um, and so, um, you know, part of that is, I think restoring our environment is very critical to restoring our economy. So that's what really sustainability is about. If we take care of our environment, we take care of our economy and our people and vice versa. So I humbly ask for your support. I'm number 15, last but not least, on the Democratic side, to do as Thank you. Roy Anthony Kanata. Thank you again to the Women Chambers. Uh, thank you to each and every one of you guys for holding out for the night with us. We really appreciate your time. So I'm number four on the Democrat side, and this 444 comes with four things. Housing, economic development, accountability, and land. On the far left side, it says heal, and we need to heal our economy, heal our island, heal our people. And that's why I'm running for senator, because making a difference begins with you. And I'm not running for myself or us here. I'm running for all of us because, you know, making a difference is all about our island and all about our people from our nannies to our nanas. So that's why I'm running. So please consider me. I'm number four. And vote Democrat. <laughs> vote for Governor Luliano Bro because you know it's right and just. <laughs> and one pat two. Make sure, okay? <laughs> four more years. Thank you. Uh, Joe Sanomisi. I can first name here. I'm going to 
Science Chamber for inviting us tonight. And you know, folks, everybody's identifying their number, but I'm number 13. And my wife told me I'm the 13th warrior when we broke the number, so just remember that. And if you remember that movie, trust me, it works. And you know what, folks, for the past six years I've, I've fought, and I will continue to fight for the people of Guam, and for our children, and for our life. Um, you know, there's many bills I even forgot to introduce that at the beginning. You know, I was the author of the, the uh, GPA tax rebate. Uh, I, I'm the author of the uh, moratorium on the, on the gas price. The gas price is going down, and it's going to continue going. And then I'm also the, uh, the author of the uh, first-time homeowners and the rising of the, the availability for everyone to buy a home when you go to uh, Guam Housing. And I thank you very much, and thank you again, the, the Chamber. And I'm number 13. I'm the 13th ward in the, on, on, on the, among the 15 of us. But please vote for all 15. Please, thank you. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, um, I was very, very delighted to be here. Um, uh, what I know is that when people trust each other, they work well together. When they take care of each other, crime gets you uh, or crime. I'm, uh, my, my platform is really just honesty, compassion, and kindness. Everybody asks me, what's your, what, what, what is it? What, what's, your, what's your platform? It's honesty, compassion, and kindness. When people trust their government and people trust their leaders, they actually do very, very well. I'm here for you. My name is Dr. My name is Dwayne Snickers. I'm number seven on the ballot. Honesty, compassion, and kindness. That's what I bring to the table. Thank you very much. All right, Jonathan Smurs. Hop it in. Once again, I want to thank the Guam Women Chamber of Commerce uh, for putting on such a great event. GCC for hosting us and each and every one of you guys for sticking out the night with us. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, I, it's about each and every one of you. It's not about me. It's not about any one of us up here. It's about the people of our island. And, that, and that's what I'm here for. I'm, about, I'm here to hear the call of anybody who, 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 who reaches out. I'm not here to shun the people who have been shunned for, for many years. I'm here to walk Swamp Road, Nevermind Road, because the reality is those are where really people are struggling on a day-to-day -day basis. No power, no water, no road. And that's what, I'm, that's what I'm fighting for in this legislature. And I'm number 14 on the Democratic side of the ballot, and I humbly ask for each and every one of your support. Thank you guys, and have a great night. Thank you. So I want to thank our candidates, but because they put a microphone in front of me, I feel the need to go off script. Um, <laughs> So, I, you know, you all came out tonight to hear a legislative forum, and I just want to tell you it's really important that you vote. Um, the decisions that are made in our legislature, they, they, they affect the laws that you have to obey. The people who are there, they, they will set the penalties for people who disobey the laws. Do you care about the, the projects that get built? Do you care about how your tax money is spent? This is, this is our community, and I just urge you all to, to have a voice in it, and you know, to look out for yourselves and for your future, and for those of us who are getting old, and you know, just, just take care of Guam, and you, and you do that by going out and voting for, for the people and the causes and the issues that, you, you know, what you feel is right, not surrendering the power to let somebody else decide what they think is right. Okay, back on script. Um,
sign on the table, they can tell you about candidates and politics and all kinds of things. Um, we also invite you to stick around and chat one-on-one -on -one with the candidates and be sure to join us again tomorrow evening for the Republican Candidates Forum. Same time, same place. Thank you and good evening and grab some food. Thanks.